Okay, so I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our moderator for today's panel. Uh, Bob Graff is a Los Angeles-based producer originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota. His resume includes more than 35 projects from over the last 30 years. And although Bob has worked with many directors, he has enjoyed a long association with the Coen brothers, dating back to Fargo and The Big Lebowski, on which he served as the location manager. Since then, he has filled various producing roles on 11 Cohen films, including Oh Brother, Where Out Thou, No Country for Old Men, True Grit, Inside Llewellyn Davis, Hail Caesar, and The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Most recently, Bob was a producer on Joel Cohen's latest film, The Tragedy of Macbeth, starring Denzel Washington and Frances McDormand, which you'll hear a little bit more about today. So please help me welcome our moderator, Bob Graff. Hi, everybody. How, how is everyone today? Um, I will, um, you know, start by just saying a few things about, uh, about the film, and then I'll introduce the rest of the people that we have with us here today. And, um, and I just want to reiterate that you are uh, welcome to chime in with questions if you like during the course of the discussion. It's, it's kind of, you know, sometimes it makes it easier to you know, uh, hit up those questions when they're when the topic is at hand. Um, so, this film this is a, this is a film that Joel uh, Cohen directed. This is the first time he's directed without his brother, without Ethan. Um, but we have a lot of the a lot of uh, collaborators that uh, have that are repeat uh, partners from uh, other Cohen brother projects, including all of the people that are here today. Um, this project is, was maybe a little bit unique and different compared to the rest of, um, you know, to the other Cone projects that certainly that I've been a part of. Um, this is an adaptation of Shakespeare's Macbeth. And it is a real, it is full on Shakespearean Macbeth. It is, you know, people in armor and people with swords and it's not translated into some sort of contemporary environment. This is really, it's the full Shakespearean text. And it is shot in black and white, uh, which I think is, it, it, and it's shot in a, in a style, it's conceived in a style that is particularly striking and and kind of you know a it's a very strong visual style that relies on a lot of shadow and a lot of contrast and sort of uh you know in a way heavily influenced by a lot of kind of german expressionism you know films like fritz films of fritz lang and uh murnau and whatnot things from the 20s and, and it's, it's, it was an interesting process that you'll hear more about as we get into this, that, you know, a, a lot of the techniques that we used in the course of, you know, doing the film were techniques that were in many cases drawn from movies from that era. You know, we used a lot of big backings, hand painted backings and a lot of um, atmosphere and, and whatnot. It's, it's a movie that is conceived to be in the boundary between, um, you know, just because of the nature of the material, it's, it's somewhere treading the boundary between kind of theatricality and realism. And that's maybe one of the central kind of design issues of the, of the project was to try and find where that line is um, and understand like how abstract we can make the scenery versus, you know, uh, you know, when we, when we make our castle, for example, in the movie is two castles. Our castles are not, they're not like real castles. This is not a cat. It's not a movie where you would go and rent a castle because that's not what you want it to look like in any case, even if there were castles in Los Angeles, which is where we shot it. It's, it's meant to be evocative of a castle and representative of a castle and maybe a little bit of an abstraction of a castle in the same way that, that theater sets frequently are. But, the the primary thing here is to make a movie that is profoundly cinematic and not filmed theater. This is not, it's not about constructing scenery that feels like it's on a stage and you are in a place in a, in a privileged position sort of watching the, the play. This is supposed to be a full cinematic expression of a theatrical text. So in any case, I'll introduce the rest of our, of our folks that we have with us today. Um, so the, the Karen Getchell is here. 
who is kind of uh, for many, many years, um, you know, 27 years, almost all these people, maybe with the exception of Stefan, I've known for almost 30 years. Um, Karen is sort of my partner in production. She's the unit production manager. Um, and she goes back even further than I do in, in, the, in the sort of Cohen uh, resume to Hudsucker, I think, maybe was your first yeah, one? Yeah, that was the first one. Um, and so we've all, you know, kind of come along together. Um, secondly, we have uh, Mary Zofries, who is our costume designer. She's going to, there she is. So uh, Mary is, you know, Mary goes back even further, I think, right? Like to Miller's Crossing, maybe? No, no I was a PA. Uh, briefly, I was a PA on Barton Fink. Okay. And then okay. I was an assistant designer on the Hudsucker Proxy. Right. So, and, and since Fargo, I think, was the first one where you were the, uh, where you were the costume designer, correct? Correct. That was and, my and, first job. And has been ever it. since. So, um, uh, I'm going to save Peter because he's got the longest resume. But uh, Stefan Deccant is our production designer. And uh, he's a rookie at having only one other credit on, on True Grit, um, but it was a distinguished, uh, <laughs> and at that time, he was an art director at that time. Um, and so Stefan is, uh, you know, his responsibilities are really, you know, for uh, designing and constructing the scenery and, the, and uh, all of that business. Peter Kurland, who is here, Peter is our production sound mixer, and is the, the uh, longest serving crew member. He, he along is one of a very select group who goes, who has, I think done every single Cohen project all the way back to Blood Simple. So it's, you know, however many years ago that was. <laughs> so, um, and Peter's in Nashville in his, in his uh, man cave in Nashville. Um, so Karen and I, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we're going to kind of go around and give everybody a chance to talk about their, their job position and how they kind of work with, you know, uh, how they have worked with Joel or in the case of the other Cohen movies, Joel and Ethan, um, over the years and how, and how we've, you know, developed a, a way of approaching their job that, you know, sometimes, frankly, people have different styles and you have to adapt your your skills and your your you know the way that you're performing your job to kind of fit in with the the you know the the you know priorities of the, of the director. Um, but I don't know you know I know that uh, all of you are students and I and I don't know how much experience uh, you know most of you have or any of you have in the business itself. But uh, Karen and I thought we would just make a few remarks about the general sort of overview of how departments work you know on a movie it's one of those things in film school as i i was in film school as well and and when you're in film school you you know you get the kind of great experience of doing a lot of different jobs you know obviously if you're on a film you're making a student film first of all you know you probably have five jobs you know if somebody's you're you know somebody's the cinematographer but they're also you know designing things they're setting lights, they're bringing snacks, they're doing all the, you know, everybody pitches in to kind of get things done in whatever way they need to get done. And, and obviously it's not unusual for people to kind of get a sampling of different positions on the movie, which I frankly think is a very valuable experience. And you'll, it's an experience that you will, that will serve you well as you move on, as all of you move on to working in the industry, because I think it's, it's, um, it's always, it's always important and illuminating to have an appreciation for what everyone else on the movie does and how difficult it is and how, and what, what their particular concerns are, because whatever your job is, you know, it, you need to understand that it's a, it's a huge collaborative effort and, and it's, you know, everybody has their own sort of, um, you know, it's like the, the, 10 blind men and the elephant, you know, every single person has their own kind of view of what the movie is, but you'd need to kind of keep in mind that uh, uh, others perspective is different. Um, so, you know, we're the, the a, a movie, a, a, a sort of, you know, for real full on movie industry 
studio picture is a much different experience than a student film. It's, it, there is a tremendous division of labor, um, which has been institutionalized in, you know, by the, by the sort of long history of the unions and how, you know, jobs are broken down between different unions, different groups. And it's very, it's a, there's a very specific kind of hierarchy. It's not exactly military, but it is, a, but there is a very particular arrangement of, of responsibilities and how people report to one another. For instance, you know, Stefan is the production designer you know, he, he and Mary are sort of in parallel, you know, both of the, both of them are reporting directly to the director in, in, in trying to, you know, um, and trying to understand as close as, as deeply as possible what the director's intentions are and trying to bring their skills to, you know, to whether it's costume design or, or production design, production design, of course, in, in, a, in the case of the movie, which I'm sure most of you know, is specifically deals with scenery with the, the, sort of construction and design of sets, but also includes the, the production designer has a sort of triumvirate of three departments under that person. Um, so there's the, the sort of art directors who are in turn overseeing the construction, the, the set designers and the construction department that is actually building the scenery. Then there is the set design, the set decorators, excuse me, are, is a separate department and they are, effectively like interior decorators. They're the people who are dealing with furniture, you know? So once the, once the box of the set is designed and constructed, the architecture, you know, if, if you will, an art direct, the art directors are in charge of architecture. The set decorators are in charge of interior design in a, in a way, you know, hang the art. Um, the carpet, the wallpaper, the, the furniture, all of that. Then there's the prop department, which is a third, you know, very specific thing. The prop department is objects, technically, specifically objects that are handled by an actor. So if the actor, it could be something they're wearing in the case of, in which case that person has to work also very closely with Mary. But, you know, they, the, in our film, you know, people are wearing armor. They've got swords. A sword is a prop. It's something that they use and hold in their hand, but it's also part of the costume. And so those people have to be working very closely with one another. Um, it's the same. It's, and there's also frequently a fuzzy line between props and set decorating. You know, if it's, if it's a book that's sitting on the shelf, it's set decorating. If it's a book that the person picks up and holds in their hand or looks at, it's a prop. But those things, again, they need to, if you want the, the film to have a consistent tone and overall, uh, you know, sort of aesthetic uh, feel and sense of the world, then you need those things to be working in concert. Um, you know, then, uh, uh, and Karen, you can leap in anytime you'd like, but the, the um, you know, the other, so, okay, those are the, you know, the, the sound department. Peter is the sort of leader of the sound team on set. He is the he is the the production sound mixer. He supervises the boom operator and a staff of people that are in charge of sort of you know obviously handling all the sound requests. Cinematography, as I'm sure you know, is another thing, separate thing. They that person reports again directly to the director. Below them is a whole staff of assistant camera people, grips, electricians. Each department has a very specific, very delineated set of responsibilities. And you know the grips don't touch touch the lights, the electricians don't touch the flags. That's the way it works. <laughs> it doesn't. It 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 seems maybe inefficient, and sometimes it is. And it's different in other countries, but in this country, that's the way it is. So um, it's a very separate kind of a thing. Well, and it, also, it also kind of assures that people are not that work is not being duplicated. I mean, it can be more efficient in that sense too. That know that things hopefully the idea is that things don't fall between the cracks because the division of labor is so clear for each department and then people are not doubling up and doing this potentially doing the same work and one other thing i was just going to say bob is that i feel like you know once you kind of really get a sense of you know the animal and all of its moving parts as a production person one of the best things that you can do is really start to think about the information that you get and where it needs to go. It's almost like you're a dispatcher and you're constantly kind of thinking about, okay, 
I learned this piece of information today. Who else needs to know that? And making sure that once you understand the way the whole machine works, you're doing your part in keeping the flow of information going to all the various arms. No, I think that's a very good point. And it also speaks to the issue that I brought up at, at the beginning, that is like knowing something about everyone's job helps you be a better conduit of information in that way. And that's the same thing. And that's, certainly that's true for Karen and for myself in, in sort of producer, production manager roles, because we are the sort of, you know, nexus of information distribution, or we should be, you know, um, because we're interfacing with all these departments and you're constantly trying to be on the lookout for something that might affect how, you know, what the plans are in, in, a, in another area of the film. Um, but each individual department also bears some of that responsibility where you ideally what you want is people who are like on their toes and they're thinking and that, and so that, you know, if somebody hears, you know, if, if, uh, uh, you know, Mary has a whole, for instance, might be, you know, the, the director has requested a particular type of fabric for a, for a costume, you know, and it's in, you know, it's, so they've been developing this stuff, but they might, that, but that fabric might be, might cause problems for Peter, you know, because it might cause, you know, it, it might make a lot of noise, you know, it might be some sort of, uh, you know, I don't even know, Mary would know better what, it, what would be an example of the fabric, but you're in a, some situation where you then like, okay, if you're wearing that costume, you can't radio mic them. So now you have to do, a, do things a different way. And that's information that Peter needs to know in order to be prepared to do what he needs to do and get, you know, the sort of, a, you know, the highest quality sound on the set. And you might say, hold on, could Peter actually hear the rustling of fabric? And those that have worked with him will say, Hell yes. Peter okay. will hear every sound imaginable. Things you would never think that you could hear. Peter will be like, hold on. Is that, am I right, Bob? Is that correct? That's, yes. I've, I've known Peter to hear things that I certainly haven't heard. <laughs> but it's, and, and it's, and the thing is, of course, that sometimes you will find that there is it, it doesn't mean there's a solution for every one of these problems. You know, it just means that the information is, is it's best if the information is circulated so that everybody can make an intelligent decision about what, where the priority is. Sometimes the priority will be like, Oh, you know, the director really wants that particular fabric, the way that, the way that that looks. And then, you know, Peter and, and will be faced with a, a, a problem where we have to figure out a different way to solve, a different way to mic it, or it has to be looped, or or it's just you run the risk of having, a, you know, problems that you have to fix in post. But those are all things that you want to just have going on up front so that everybody is, is you're able to make those decisions with all the information. So do you want to make the rounds and uh, kind of talk to each person about their jobs a little bit and have them expound on kind of what they do, who they interact with, how they got there? Yeah. Why don't we, why don't we do that? And uh, do you, maybe I'll start with you, Karen. <laughs> um, so well, we already talked a little bit about it, but it's, yeah. but uh, yeah, let's, let's, uh, I don't know, let's start with Stefan. Um, it's, you know, I think that, this movie, we were talking about this yesterday, that this particular movie was, you know, very clear, I think, in, in Joel's mind from the very beginning. You know, the very first time I spoke to him about this, the, the project was quite a while ago now, you know, a year and a half, two years ago, something like that. And, it, and even at, at that time, I mean, he would talk about it in a very similar way to, to, to how it turned out. But, you know, the process of making a movie is, is in a lot of ways is the process of getting a huge group of people, 120, 150, whatever your, however big your crew is, you know, uh, obviously it could be fewer, but you've got to get those, that group of people needs to try to understand what is, what the priorities are and what the movie is about fundamentally or what kind of movie the director is trying to make. And then you try to figure out how to bring your own skills to that. And so, you know, Stefan can talk, I think we have some images of, you know, research images that we started with very early on in the process that, um, 
that kind of guided the design, you know, phases. And we're not showing any, I do want to make clear that, uh, and I uh, just, because, you know, we've only just finished this film a few weeks ago, we're not showing any photography from, from the actual sets, just because we're, you know, we're early enough that I just, we wouldn't want any images like that to escape as a kind of first look of the film. So, but we did bring, uh, we have a number of kind of design renderings and sketches and, and a lot of research that, as I said, that kind of guided our visuals. So it'll give you an idea of what, of what we're up to. Stefan? Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, I, what's great about working with Bob is he can, he can describe your job better than you can. So that's, that's perfect for this um, format. Um, just to, to explain where I came from is, um, uh, and not to get, I, just be less didactic at first, you know, Bob, just so you can understand the process of how this works. You know, Bob gave me a call on a Saturday and already, you know, just to get a call and it says Bob Graff, he goes, well, that's probably gonna be a good call. And then when he said, would you like to meet with Joel tomorrow about Macbeth? That was, I mean, I don't know who says no to that. So for, for me, I, I had a, a night to kind of read, read the text and go through it. And, and what was interesting is not just that when you're getting that script, it, it has Joel's vision in there. You're not, you're not just getting the, the Shakespearean uh, text there. It, how, it's, how he has it laid out, the environments he describes, how the transitions happen, you can see it in there. And one of the things that I could see right away is, is that there was um, kind of this, there's, a, there's a, a pattern that runs through the original text of Macbeth. And you'll find similar themes running that are overlapped and repeated. And you can see that Joel was starting to find visuals and overlapping those visuals. So what I did um, for that first meeting was to kind of go through the text, kind of, I had the primer from Bob just as he gave it to you. So I knew where we were kind of leaning in, in terms of photography and the reference, see what I could find on my own that, so I could at least be in that zone to have a conversation with, with a, with a new director, because I hadn't worked with Joel in this capacity as a production designer. I'd worked with him as an art director, but um, that's kind of when you have the world laid out for you and your tasks laid out for you and you're, you're servicing another designer and you're servicing the director. So um, this, was, this was just a brand new experience with a new director for me. And it was a fantastic meeting. That was the next day, it was really great. And, and um, you could see that Joel, he he and his cinematographer Bruno, who had, they had pulled together a series of images. God, I don't know. Bob could tell you how long it was, but but they had already kind of done kind of the basics of the world building by by pulling images from different films, different um, photographers, different architects, and it was starting to lay out what this world was. And, I, and I'll take you through some of those images, uh, but you know. At least as I was understanding it from Joel, he wanted to find a purpose for making this version of Macbeth. I mean, why make it again? And visually, what was going to set it apart? And how was it not going to be Wells or Polanski? And, you know, and and getting into kind of you think about the line, all is fair and foul, meaning that there's a cloudiness to it and and a dreamlike quality to it. I think when he was looking at um, at the German Expressionist work, and then people who were influenced by German Expressionism, that it, we could kind of see him playing with light and shadow to illustrate the you know the good and evil even within the, the story. So I'll show you some of the stuff that that um, that we first uh, were looking at. So here are some of the key Im images that that Joel was showing right away. And again, as Bob was talking about, he wanted to kind of get an abstraction so that we're not talking about a castle. We are talking about something that gives you the psychology of a castle. So of any of these images, maybe the one on the left could actually be within something that is a castle, but everything else were stairways, courtyards, um, the photography on the right, um, you know, it was just kind of uh, of a Shigemoto 
it's just kind of, is that, could that be the, a castle wall and a castle tower? It was just really kind of distilling this and letting, it, it, and letting the, the, the shapes um, and the forms kind of really interact in with the, um, with the cinematography. So we, 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 you know, he, you know, I met with Bob and Joel and Fran and, and they had this deck of, of photographs that we would go through. And so, you know, these, these images, specific images lent themselves to Inverness, which is Macduff's, or, or I'm sorry, Macbeth's castle. And then um, we also talked about um, a, a theater designer from the turn of the century, uh, Edward Gordon Craig. And we talked about his productions and, and he, he was this modernist uh, set designer. And we were looking at just, again, distilling these environments just to the simplest forms and seeing how that could create a psychological space that re reflected what was in, in the uh, text. And we also looked at a lot of films and, and, and not together, but, but Joel would say, listen, these are the influences. And, and Rebecca, the cinematography of Rebecca was there as well as Night of the Hunter was a, was a major touchstone for us. And it was that kind of, again, the abstraction and pulling it away from reality. Now, if you look at something like Rebecca, it's a film that's within the, the aesthetic of what that type of filmmaking was uh, in the 40s. But there were, the, the way it's shot, and especially looking at these shears here, was kind of the simplification of the frame. So by bringing those shears in, it's now all about this woman standing in front of them. Um, we, we, again, some of it is not always cinematography. It was um, uh, just looking at photography and seeing where these fit into those environments. Um, so that was my first meeting. And then I was finishing up a project um, and I had one week just to kind of wrap it up. So what, what I did was I, I sat with Joel uh, for three more nights the next week. We went through the script and he kind of laid out how he saw, we went through the script scene by scene and, and he drew uh, planned drawings of, of how he saw each scene being shot and photographed and, and how that, and how, what was kind of the psychology of each of those scenes. So when I got an art department starting the following week, what I wanted to do is take all that information that had from Joel and those images that we had gone through and looked at and um, wanted to kind of find the, the knowns and unknowns. The knowns would be things that I knew that Joel had a strong point of view of what the courtyard looked like. I knew he had a strong point of view of what Inverness, Macbeth's castle looked like. He had a strong point of view of what the throne room at, at the at Duncan's castle looked like. At, at, at the other castle, Dunsinane. And those were the things that I hit right away. Because what I want to do when I get in and start an art department is I kind of want to reflect that world that the director is coming up with right back at them. So the first thing I do is I take all that reference photography, blow it up and get it on the walls so that we can kind of walk through the movie. The next thing is surround myself with a team that can start working with that imagery and create new imagery and so we can kind of reflect that back to Joel. And one of the ways, because we had a very short prep time to do that was digitally. And um, we started building environments in 3D right away so that we could get Joel in there and he could sit down with the artists and start pushing walls around. And since the, the spaces were abstract, we could, um, we could, we didn't have to build complicated models. And it was something where he'd get feedback right away from Joel. And as we got something that he liked, boom, we put that up on the wall. So that, that we're starting to grow this filmscape in there. And so I, I'll go back and I'll show um, some of those sketches and some of the things that we did. You know, I, I'm not the, a terribly uh, astute uh, illustrator, but I, enough that I can start having conversations with Joel and start talking about well, how do we want to use shears? How does, how does the window in that previous um, photograph work for us? How does that scene play out when Lady Macbeth travels across her room? Um, and actually, because 
my strength isn't these finished uh, illustrations. It allowed me to kind of even make more uh, looser illustrations that Joel could read into. And at the same time, again, we were using uh, 3D modeling that we could go in and quickly paint over and show textures and, and um, age. And we could riff off of other other um, sets that we had seen. This is this was uh, influenced by um, a set in Faust, in Murnau's Faust. And again, these are other images that Joel had presented. As you can see, that there's a kind of a brutal formality to to one castle and the other castles. We get into the King's Castle, into Duncan's Castle, that we bring the verticality and we start bringing the arches in there. And we were just, again, trying to reduce it. What's the least amount of imagery we could have in the frame to still tell the picture? It's also, is one of those things in the, because we were, you were able to model these spaces, which are, they're, they're generally like very kind of plain or very simple, yeah. you know, not heavily ornamented. It's because we were able to model them in 3D, it allows you to light those those models because the the thing that was that was clear from the beginning was in in this in on this movie more than on on many of the other movies just the importance of of uh how the the cinematographer was inserted into the design process because i mean you can sort of see from some of these images the degree to which the the sort of the light is almost another architectural element. You know, it's really the interaction between these windows and these spaces, and these hard shadows and, and how those things work. And so it was not, um, you know, it, it was helpful to be able to see them in a 3D model where you can throw some light through some arches and feel how that's going to work uh, in just sitting there looking at the computer screen. Yeah, and that that's absolutely right. And and they because in all these sets, I mean every set is made to be shot, but these were these sets in a in a greater way had to be supporting the, the cinematography in a way that I've never done before. And and what was great is that Bruno was right there while we were like Bruno and Joel would sit down, we would review sets, and they could come in and push the walls around, come up with new ideas. I mean, Bruno was a fantastic collaborator in all of this. I mean, and, uh, and he can draw, which is fantastic. So sometimes he would come into your office and go, I drew this. You may not want to build it, but it's fine if you like. And, and it would always be brilliant. And you'd go, oh, yeah, sure, absolutely. And they, they were great. I loved, I loved working with both Joel and Bruno. And, um, and, and they, it was their, these images were from their collaboration. You know, in many ways, I felt a little bit like, I won't go to Ringo, but let's say George Harrison just kind of meeting Paul and John and going, well, this is the music you guys want to write? Okay, great. I'll follow in with you guys on that. Um, because they really had a vision. And then, and then Bruno, as he, as he was introducing me to the, more to the films of Carl Dreyer, you know, I could get in and find shapes and forms in, in Dreyer's films that felt good to me. And then these are more sketches. And we can talk about this later, but there's like even this was a set where I couldn't figure out how I could have the. We would have very limited money, and I didn't know how I could do walls in the throne room for. So for a while, we were like, maybe we don't have walls. Maybe it's just black. Um, we did end up having walls. And again, just very quick illustrations. And sometimes it was just the 3D that we worked out ourselves, where light and shadow was told us what we needed to do. But again, I think one of our major touchstones was Night of the Hunter and that kind of artifice, where it's, it's, not, like, it's not like looking at Gone with the Wind and going, oh, that's cool, it's of the time, and there's the backing, and this is how the light's coming in. It was like what, what um, Charles Lawton was doing with Night of the Hunter was like, no, it, it is this. This is a psychological space. And, and I don't know if the, if it's you know how well if the students if you if you know that movie but if you don't it's a really really fascinating movie to to check out it's it's it, you know these sets these are these are shots from Night of the Hunter and these sets are uh, in a lot of cases they're constructed out of two dimensional cutout elements like these houses and this that ridge and all of that stuff is. Those are little two-dimensional pieces, and the, the sets are specifically designed to be photographed 
they're not environments. They're shots. They're, they're, yeah. they're sets that are designed to be photographed from a specific place in a specific way. And, and it was a big kind of touchstone in terms of, you know, how you combine um, a, a, a theatrical abstraction in a very, very um, cinematic way. And, and we, we leaned into that hard. I mean, these, what we were, everything we had designed was to be shot for specific, um, for a specific point of view. You know, these, again, just very quick sketches that I could do. And what I liked is that Joel could read these, we could go, and we didn't have to be precious about, about it. Again, we looked at Faust, again, and you can see it's just an abstraction. That tells you everything. Crossroads, tree, moon. Uh, and finding the psycho psychology of spaces as well. Um, this is from Ivan's childhood. And then again, when we're talking about duality of images, and this is getting a little esoteric, I'm, I'm trying to go back and forth, like what we actually did. And then there is the themes that we were running through there is again, the duality of image. So we have, when we're in Burnham Woods, where the, where the forces to, to, to overthrow Macbeth are gathering, we have an alley of trees. So we have kind of an architecture of trees. And then to present, have that reflected in a, in a throne room where we have an architecture of columns so that we're seeing the duality of the columns and the duality of the images. And again, fair as foul is always playing with the, are we sure of what we're looking at? How, how foggy, how, 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 are we, we'll look at, we look at something and we think it's a sky, we see a bird flying across it, but then it reveals to be a beach with a man walking across it. So playing uh, really with the cinematic aspects of it. But that, that, those were the, start, the starting points of it. And, and for me, because I think uh, you want to hear from somebody else, but, but for me, it was about taking all that information in from Joel, trying to school myself in, in all this cinematic history. Plus, I would ride to work and listen to different professors talking about Macbeth so I could really understand Macbeth. So every, every morning was a different podcast, just listening and just trying to make sure I understood that. And at the same time, it's just working with this group of people where we're all trying to create this vision. And, um, and that's, again, like Bob was saying, that's a cinematographer working with, with Bruno, definitely, and, and making sure that my stuff was folding in with Mary's. Now, unfortunately, I was just trying to make sure I had sets, so I didn't have that many conversations with Mary. But I, I, I mean, but I'm such a fan of hers, and I love her work. That I was like, I cannot, this has got to get to this ne next level. And then, and then always, and this doesn't get mentioned much, but having someone like Bob who can walk into your office and go, you know, I had a thought. And, and, and that means just as much as all those other collaborations. And you, you just have all these visual people that are coming together and helping make this process. So I'll just stop there. That's kind of how, how I entered in, into that. Process. And I think it's interesting, too, because the, whole, the process of designing the movie, you know, of, of the designing the scenery also is, you know, okay, so just to, to back up, because I don't think I mentioned this, that, that in going along with the lines of, uh, you know, finding this line between abstraction and realism, you know, the, all the sets on the movie are built, everything is built on stage. So is there are no, we're, there's no location shooting anywhere. It's not like you went out and found a house or a castle or a church or any, any, any of those things. So it's, and I think that at the, at, you know, you might, um, you know, it might maybe it might not be surprising to, to those of you that are uh, you know savvy about the business or read the trades that you know the um, the the budget that you can get to make a black and white version of Macbeth, even with Denzel Washington and Francis McDormand directed by Joel Cohen, is not inexhaustible. So you have it's a it's a it's a pretty specialty product a product. So you're constantly up against the challenge of of how do you, um, you know, how do you spend the resources that you have in order to kind of achieve the, the ultimate goals of the movie? And, and I think that the process for us in of making the movie was 
also one of a kind of slow realization of just really what it was going to take because I think that you know there really was a, a a point early on where we went into it with a very you know with an idea that we could oh it's just going to be we're going to have walls and just it's some you know we might not even need a bedroom for this scene it'll just be a wall with a shadow and a and a bed in the foreground or what and it would be very very spare and very abstracted and i think that then as as but as we kind of pers- you know progressed through the design process and through the 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 thinking of the movie you realize that like well okay you know really the the vision that Joel has always had is comes from this this research and it's and to to get to that we're going to need a little bit more than just a wall with a shadow and a bed and so then it's it becomes a whole you know uh thing of well how do we do that and how do we take um how do we build how do we build scenery modularly that we can reuse you know i know stefan and his team were constantly we had endless meetings about how we could reuse you know arches from one set and take them apart and reassemble them into a different set um you know there are two enormous like three story stairways in the movie and and you know uh how we could use pieces of those for you know and reuse them it, it you know so that was another you know, in addition to sort of just finding the movie and designing it and figuring out how to how to make it look best, you have to always figure out how to make it look best for what, you know, given the resources that you have as well. And that's, sometimes those things are at odds. Um, yeah, you know, two, two small stories on that is like, one, one thing was, we went so far as Tenet had a large set that was on stage 16, which we were going to go into. And they built it, it was foam from... Stage 16, by the way, is one of the largest sound stages in Los Angeles. It's, it's enormous with about a 65 foot ceiling and, you know... So. And not only that, it has a tremendous pit. And then at some point, they even raised the stage to make it higher. And so Chris Nolan had this set filled as some kind of cavern in Tenet. And they were striking that. And I was walking by one day and thought, that's a lot of foam. I'm going to need foam for rocks. So just going in and going, hey, do you think that um, we could take some of that foam? And so fortunately, Carrot and Bob were able to set me up with some trailers. And we were able to kind of take some of Tenet's foam so we could reuse it. Just go, okay, we don't have to pay for that. That's free. Now I can take it. I can turn it into rocks. We also had another set. We had a fill stage 16, which again, seemed like it was going to be a smaller set and it kept getting bigger and bigger. And, and Joel's like, ah, I just need some dirt. And then the dirt needed grasses and, and we couldn't figure out how to do that. And uh, there's a guy who uh, is working on Mandalorian who made a machine that uh, blows glue and, and, and moss at the same time. And so we were like, well, maybe that will work. And we brought him by and, um, and he goes, I only have one color. It's bright green. It's like, okay, it's black and white. Let's see how it works. And we goosed up the machine and sprayed it on. It looked great. And he goes, um, well, how much do you need? I said, well, I can only afford this much. And this is where it's good to keep contacts and make friends because he's like, don't worry about it, Steph. I got you covered. We'll just blow this whole thing out. And so it was an odd set to walk into color the next day with this bright green uh, stuff blown all over the place, but it did work. It created the texture. And, as and, it, was walking, and, it, and, and it's one of those things that like, if you've ever shot anything in black and white, you, you, the translation between color and black and white is different than you might think it, than your eye, you know, might think. So, you know, yes, this crazy bright green thing sort of, happened to hit the kind of, you know, the right and as he was walking away, away. As he was walking away, I said, well, what else does Mandalorian have? And he goes, well, we have these trees. I said, well, are you using them now? Are you done? He's like, no, nah, I think we're going to return them soon. I was like, could you just bring them over to Warner Brothers? So it's always good to keep contacts from last shows in these situations and pull in as many favors as you can. Um, so, you know, keep your friends close. Well, so maybe we'll let Mary and uh, Peter jump in a little bit and talk uh, talk a little bit about um, about their process as well. Uh, uh, Peter, you want to you want to leap in? Sure. Though it's it's I always like these discussions because I get to see what other people's perspectives were on the same experience <laughs> I just went through. See exactly, it's the blind man and the the same blind man and the elephant. 
<laughs> and I was hoping as I watched Stefan's designs, I would say I could look at them and just say, well, those are just amazing, which they are. But I, I'm haunted because each one of them, as I see, it has, you know, 40 feet of headroom and it's got hard light and it's got hard surfaces. And so for me, on one hand, it's all beautiful. But on the other hand, it's, you know, they're, they're, they're things I have to contend with during production, which is not nothing he has to worry about, but it's something I have to think about all the time. Um, and that's true for a lesser extent of, you know, Mary's work you were talking before about, you know, different kinds of texture materials and how they might sound and swords and how they might rattle and armor and how that, how you get a radio mic under that. So I don't, I don't have the, my job doesn't call for me to be um, in pre-production for very long. I don't get to do the same level of planning. I come in very late in the game. Um, and I, and I essentially have to find a way to work in the environment that's presented and to, to get, to have the ability to capture performance, which is, which is what I do. And I have, um, I have a team and it's, it's a little less hierarchical in that, you know, I, I have a, uh, I work with a boom operator who I've worked with for 25 years, uh, who may be retiring, I can't tell. Um, and a utility person, who I've worked with uh, for a very long time, and we all look at our different our different portions of the job that to be done, and we go about doing them. So, you know, I, I never worry about the fabrics because that's what Randy does. Randy is the one who does all of the wiring when we have to wire actors. Uh, he he went in uh, in advance and he spent his time um, with the with the costume department looking at the, the materials and, and, and how to deal with things during the course of production. For example, um, you know, Fran didn't want to have to worry about radio mic transmitters. And so working with Randy, uh, Mary and her, her people were able to sew pouches in the wardrobe like they would in theater so that she would never have to handle it for, um, for Macbeth's wardrobe. He was all of his wires when he wore them were built into the wardrobe. So he would come on set. He would never have to be wired. He put on his jacket and he'd go, which doesn't seem like a big thing, but it it was what made possible for those performers to give the best performance. And so those that, are the it, it, right because in the case of Denzel, for example, Denzel is you know he's when he's getting into the zone, he doesn't want to be fussed with for. 15 minutes while somebody's running his wire. And so it is, it's right. part of the, you know, when you're looking for these tricks to sort of, you know, um, make things work and as frictionless as possible. Yeah. And I, and I, I don't like to have wires on people. I don't think they sound good. Uh, and sometimes they're necessary. And if you've got a big wide shot, uh, they're necessary. Um, the advantage I have working with, with Joel for so long is that, I know that he is largely going to cover scenes in a particular way. And that means that there's going to be a close up opportunity where we can get sound on the boom and not have to worry so much about the wide shots. And that saves a lot of anxiety. It's not completely dependable, um, but it's kind of dependable. And that, again, that comes from, you know, from, from years of experience working with the same people and kind of getting an idea of what to expect and how to work with them. This was a very, um, a very different movie uh, for him and for me, uh, sound-wise, um, because lighting technology has changed, which made a big impact. Um, camera technology has changed, which made a big impact. Um, even though we were all on the stage, there's a tremendous amount of uh, film crew or film equipment generated noise to deal with, um, and in the in big empty spaces, um, every little sound on a stage uh, is amplified a thousand times. So that's kind of what, and, and Kelly, who is the utility person, that sort of becomes her bailiwick. She's out there putting carpets down for actors to walk on, putting up sound blankets so that the echoes are reduced, um, a variety, you know, a whole variety of things that I'm sure you heard of uh, Patricia talking about when, when she spoke to your group. Um, so again, my world is a little bit different than, than the design world with a lot of prep. Uh, I also, I, I'm working with, um, 
uh, Skip Leafse, who is the post-production mixer, uh, who he counts on me to provide him uh, good raw materials and good dialogue to work with. Um, but Skip ultimately is the arbiter of what gets used. So it's very much a collaboration, even though we never see each other or talk to each other. Um, we try to be on the phone whenever possible. I try to go to the mixes when I can. Uh, we know what to expect from each other, uh, and that really helps. But again, that's a byproduct of having worked with Skip for al almost 40 years now. Um, so um, I recommend that before you start, you get a bunch of 40-year relationships behind you so that you can, you can do your job to the best of your abilities. Do you, um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about, like, you know, over the course of your long relationship with, with Joel and Ethan and, like, how, and, and, and Skip, because you were just talking about, like, giving him the raw materials. You, you know, when you're mixing, you know, you're mixing on the set, you're mixing a dailies track. You're, you're also collecting frequently ISO, you know, off camera. You're, rec you know, because you're not always, if it's a scene between two people, you're, you're not just recording necessarily the person who's on camera, you're also recording the person who's off camera and mixing that. And it's, you know, different directors have, and different sound mixers maybe have a different set of expectations about what you're collecting and what you're presenting. Right, and, 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 that, and that has, that's varied a little bit over the years. And, and with Joel, I had a conversation with him uh, as we went into the COVID era, uh, because some of those things which are luxuries um, aren't easy to do when you can't have uh, two boom operators on stage um, when you have to simplify things as much as possible. But up until now, traditionally, I like to have two boom operators. I like to record all the off-camera performances because sometimes you don't want to cut away. And so you stay on one person, but you're hearing the other person talk. Or sometimes there's overlap, and rather than having to say to the director, oh, wait a second, we can do that again, the actors are talking over each other, you have a clean recording, essentially, of each one. Um, and, and sometimes Joel has been known to use, sometimes he'll use that off-camera line and put it into the mouth of a shot that, you know, he'll substitute that audio. Oh, yeah, and, and oftentimes, and I don't think anybody ever wants to talk about this, but oftentimes with actors, their off-camera performance is much better than their on-camera performance. And uh, since a lot of the performance is tied up in the, in the speech, then you can get away with a lot, and particularly on wide shots where you're cheating in the dialogue on you know, everybody. You can put in whatever performance seems to work, and you can't, generally you can't tell. Um, HD has cut into that technique a little bit, but not a lot, um, because you're still, people will accept a lot in terms of lip sync, a, a, a shocking amount, actually, in terms of lip sync. Um, but a good dialogue editor can put dialogue into... A oh, and there's, yeah, there's technology that, that moves that stuff around, but, you know, people started cheating dialogue when they first started putting sound in movies and they're, they're, they're still doing it today. Um, anyway, so I, you know, I don't have that experience in pre-production where I'll sit down with Joel or whoever's directing and say, you know, what do you think of this scene? Or what do you think of that scene? Or how should we do this? What my relationship with Joel, uh, I mean, a, I've known him a long time and I, I know what he expects. And since I go to the mix frequently, I can see what worked for him and what didn't. Um, but also, I know on the set during the day, he doesn't want to have to think about it. He doesn't want me going to him, you know, every 15 minutes and saying, hey, I heard a truck come through that. He wants everything to be perfect, and he never wants to know about it. And that's fine with me. He's, he does, if there's a real problem, he's happy to help me. If there's a scene that it's just not working, or if there's an actor he can understand, or he's not talking loud enough and I have to, um, I can go to him. Um, Randy does most of that because Randy's on the set and I'm 50 or 100 feet away. And so Randy, I'll say to Randy, this is horrible, this doesn't work at all. I don't know what's wrong with these people. And Randy will go to Joel and say, uh, Peter, we're like a little more volume, please. And that, that's a, a, a relationship and a translation, translation that has worked for me very well over the years. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, I have a very good relationship with Joel and we chat, but very rarely am I talking to him on the set about sound or sound issues. 
um, because he just expects that I will get it right and I just will do everything possible to make that happen for him. On this particular movie too, you know, one of the issues, as Peter pointed out, was like had to do with the lighting technology. And it was something that Peter had raised early in pre-production that we tried to address, you know, in the course of lighting and rigging these sets, but it did become a problem. And it was this, it's one of those issues where you've got, um, kind of, you know, competing interests in different departments. And, and in this case, the, the lighting, you know, concerns won out over the sound concerns. You know, we were using a lot of, you know, we're on stage and we're using a lot of these, um, what, what we would call mover lights. They're, it's a, it's a remote controlled um, computer operated uh, light. It's the sort of thing you would see in a concert show, you know, that's panning and tilting and it can zoom and it can change uh, color temperature and, and you can add, uh, you know, effects to it. It's, it, they're incredibly um, flexible, but, you know, we would rig these sets with, you know, some of our sets had 50 or 80 of these things up in truss up above the, the, the sets. And they were... I think they were 16 had, had close to 200. And, and each right. one of them has, I mean, there has, a, has a fan in it. Right. And, so, and one fan is quiet. 200 fans is not quiet. And 200 right. fans in an echoey giant space is impossible. And to the ear, it doesn't sound like anything. But, you know, the microphone, you know... The human ear and the, the whole connection inside the brain is designed to filter out background noise. Microphones can't do that. And once it's recorded, your ear can't do it either. So it becomes really difficult to deal with that. And, you know, I work frequently and very closely and sometimes at a, at a, a high speech volume with the gaffer to try to resolve some of these things. And it, we discovered, we learned all kinds of things. Like, for example, you could turn the light off but the fan stays on. And the only way to get the light to be quiet is to unplug it, which isn't so easy when it's 100 feet in the air and there's 200 of them, and it takes time to go back and do it. So, you know, we had these plans every day. Well, we're going to shoot over there, and for now we'll have all the ones in the back of the stage turned off, and then we'll do the ones over there. And over the course of the show, um, he managed to get a lot more of the very quiet ones, which was very helpful. Um, and we learned to not put the, the noisy ones near actors where we could. So it was, a, it was an evolving situation, but it required, again, you were talking about this earlier, Bob, it requires um, every department to work with every other department. Uh, and I find, well, from my perspective, it's particularly my department has to deal with everybody so that I'm not interfering with their work or affecting the way the sets or the costumes or the lighting works, but that uh, we can also get good usable sound from it. I'm sure also in this case, in this movie, just because of the nature of the scenery, you're, you're, you know, this, as you maybe saw from the photographs and the, and the imagery that it's, you know, a lot of these sets were big, um, stark, not heavily furnished and meant to be, you know, there's sort of, the walls are sort of, plaster you know finished as stone you know so it's like but you're but of course they're made out of plywood and with a plaster covering on them so you're in you know you're you're in an environment that is meant to be a castle made out of stone but it's the walls are hollow and so you can those environments can be boxy and echoey and you it's like it's a sort of thing when you're walking up a hollow staircase it's different than when you're walking up a stone staircase in a church well even as much as you know we had that in the big colonnade there's you know there's a there's a stone walkway and it's made out of wood and when people are walking across it you know it sounds like wood it doesn't sound like stone and so it it becomes in that gray area between theater where, where the audience expects the scenery to be made out of wood and real life where everybody expects walking on stone to sound a particular way or walking up a stone set of stairs or across a, a, a dirt floor expects it to sound a certain way. This, in, in the sound world, this was more, in my view, towards trying to make it what you expect in reality, that you didn't want to hear people's footsteps on plywood or on you know stage floor 
Uh, and so we spent a lot of time uh, quieting people's footsteps, laying carpets, so that after, after we're done, you know, the Foley people can come in and put in footsteps that match the surfaces that, that our, our brain expects to hear, given what we're seeing. Um, and that's, fortunately, that's a technology that's fairly easy to do, uh, but it, it, it required a great deal of cooperation from the, from the costumers who had to, you know, glue foam to everybody's feet all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, the actors and how it feels when they're walking. So, you know, everything, everything I do to make the sound better impacts negatively on every other department in every way and so it's always trying to, to draw the right balance. Does this, does this affect your self-esteem, Peter? <laughs> it's, you know, when it's all done, I, I'm, I, as, as I, think, I think Mark Ulano said, we're all part of a, of a big symphony and when we're all done, we're, we're hearing this wonderful piece of music, but it, you know, in the middle of it, I am, I am the one with the tuba stumbling around and dropping it on people. Uh, all right, uh, Mary, I think Mary is up. Um, so uh, Mary has a couple of images as well and can talk a little bit about, um, you know. I mean, I, uh, I, I, I think it, sorry to interrupt, but I mean, I think it, I would start by just saying how I started on this particular project, which didn't have to do with the images. So I don't, we can bring them up later. Um, and it is, a lot of those images that you saw, saw from Stefan, uh, they were part of an initial meeting I had with Joel. But And what predated that was a phone conversation with him where uh, at that point he didn't even know for sure if it was going to be black and white. But he, he, did, he did tell me his, the vision verbally. And it was this sense of abstraction and what Bob had spoke of before and theatricality. And, but I remember him also saying, and yeah, I have no idea what the clothes are going to look like. And, and I, I want it to feel old <laughs> and not a specific period, which I think is a very interesting way to approach Macbeth because in other cinematic approaches and theatrical approaches, they um, sometimes have an ambiguous time period. And so that was a very interesting concept for me. And um, so you wanted it to feel not contemporary, but it didn't have to set itself in, in any certain time. And the photographs that you saw earlier were, they were one of maybe a hundred and Joel and Bruno had co co collected these images and Joel had them printed. So the first in-person meeting I had with Joel, he had printed a set of those photographs. I don't know if you remember that, Bob and we laid them out on the table and that was the first time I'd ever gotten a glimpse of you know you can hear the word abstraction and hear the word architecture and hear the word like not old but or look old but you to visually see these pictures that they had called together was what was very inspiring and and it gave a very clear picture of what their vision was for this film. And I was immediately struck, it's very architectural. Not only is it pictures of architecture, but it's architectural in its nature and it's graphic and it's shapes in its nature. And that's what was struck me the most. And for my first, but, but like I said, Joel was, there, there are some pictures with people in them, but he was like, that. The, it, it's really for the photograph or for the lighting or for the, it's not really for what they're wearing per se, um, but there are some images that have a specific silhouette. And so shape and silhouette was um, something that I came away from that meeting thinking that would be very, very important in the co concept and in the design of this film. And so, you know, we were, this was in the summer, but we started filming in January, I think, or February, 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 the following year. But this was back in June and July. I had this initial meeting and I just started thinking about um, how to sort of approach this. And, and, you know, we would have phone conversations and, you know, rewatching. Um, I remember watching Kurosawa's uh, Throne of Blood, but that wasn't necessarily like, 
it's just a really interesting theatrical way of telling a Macbeth like story. But um, just the more you watch and the more you look and you're just trying to find inspiration because it was just kind of, honestly, it was like throwing ideas at the wall and seeing what stuck. And I've never, and I, I sketched so much for this film and I would run something by without any ego attached. What do you think of this? And, or images, what do you think of this? And it's not, and, and Joel and I have worked together long enough for, I don't get my feelings hurt at all. If he's like, no, or if he's like, yeah. And I found that he was responding, you know, and occasionally I was putting out some um, pieces of research. And again, like I said, we weren't trying to time frame it at all, but I did go down the path of when Macbeth was supposed to, was written, which is in like 14, early 1400s. So, you know, like you're automatically, your brain automatically goes to like research and you want to find something visual and tangible that you can like show the director. And then I thought about when Macbeth actually lived and started going that, down that rabbit hole. And that is more of a medieval time period. And, and I would say, and, and then we started looking at fashion runway because I found that, um, in some instances, Joel was responding, Joel and Fran were responding to research, and in some instances, like my sketches weren't working at all. Um, and it was just a combination of a lot of different inspiring pieces for me and inspiring visual images that came together more so than on any other film, like probably on, more so than on any other film I've done. And in this, for me, this was the first time where it was quote, um, I guess you'd call it world building, as opposed to looking at being inspired by a book, for instance, um, you know. Yeah, that's, it's, it's interesting that you say that, because I think that's, yes, it, in, in contrast, I mean, we said this many times through in, in the course of shooting the movie, that in, in some ways you had to begin to think of it like you were making a science fiction movie. Yeah. It was, because it's, in a different way than like the, the movies that Joel had done previously that we had worked on with him there, a lot of his movies, a lot of the Cone movies are really grounded in, in classic film genres sure. in a specific period in a specific uh, slice of Americana, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's the West or the South or the gangster movie or what it's like, it's they're, like yeah. They're grounded somewhere and you can go to a place for research and for inspiration. You, you kind of know what those touchstones are. And this was different than that. And right. it, took, it was the process of everybody getting into his head and understanding what right. it was and being able to feed it back to him was right. difficult. Yeah, but interesting but, yes. and, and difficult, exactly. but really interesting and terrifying. Like I, I think for me, it was like you're, um, like walking on a balance beam and like, you know, and because of the budget that we spoke of and the time frame that we spoke of, you know, you're like, so you decide, you make this decision and you decide on the fabric that you're going to make it out of. And then you're like, okay, you're crossing your fingers. Like, I hope this is going to work. But, um, but so we came up with, uh, and so we decided that we would approach it through rules. And I think Stefan, you probably had that same kind of, um, conversation with them of like, okay, what are the rules of this film? And I said, you know, as I always do, this is how I approach film. I always think of the leads first. What does Macbeth, what is Macbeth going to look like? What is Lady Macbeth going to look like? And then, and then from, um, from talking to them, like we decided to, you know, we, I showed them that, like I did a breakdown, which you guys, I don't know if you know, but you read a script and you do, I do a handwritten breakdown. Some people do it, um, by it in a computer generated uh, format. I find that writing it down helps it get it in my brain and, it, and I digest it fully so that I know the arc of that character and I feel like I'm entrenched in their emotional journey by doing that breakdown. And so I, you kind of are in, in sync with that. So I do my breakdown and I went through it with them and we talked about we should spare and shave down the amount of changes. Like just because it goes from night to day to night, like for instance, we decided that Macbeth would, once we narrowed, we figured out the silhouette of Macbeth, 
he pretty much stays the same throughout the whole film. When he becomes a king, the fabrication change changes, but not his silhouette. And that was a proposal I made to Joel and Fran, and they love that. And I said, you know, and part of it's like finding what's flattering on Macbeth. And then we decided that many of the men that were soldiers in the play and in the film would would be dressed in the same way. There wouldn't necessarily be a hierarchy of captain versus foot, you know, regular soldier. And it was to simplify it. And that comes from these photographs that they, the, it was a pared down simplification. But um, how we arrived at that decision was just an evolution of concepts that we finally narrowed down. I hope I'm describing it because it was very abstract how it happened. And so in a very crass way of saying it, we figured out what would work on Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, and those were the silhouettes that we expanded to other characters. Like, this is how the women dress in our movie, but it was based on a silhouette that we wanted to work, make, and I knew that would work on Fran, and that's how Lady Macduff dresses, and that's even the same silhouette on the servants. And um, so we came up with our rules, and then it was a lot of what is the fabric, and what are we going to make it out of? And I really, I was going to chime in when you said before, I do, I try never to use something that Peter's going to, that's going to really like crinkle up and sound horrible. Um, but I just, blamed it on the director. It wasn't you. <laughs> yeah, but if I, if honestly, like, and this is because we're, we're talking to people who are going to go into this craft, like you want to direct, you want to guide your director because you have a field of expertise that they do not. And so if you, if they really want like a crinkly sounding taffeta for lack you know you always take the fabric and you kind of rub it together and if it's really noisy i just drop it it's not even an it's not even a choice it's i don't offer it as a choice for the director because that's not going to work down the line and even though it's a pain for peter inevitably it's going to come and bite you in the derriere so it's better to just ixnay it and not offer that to begin with so uh, that's just something that i have learned um throughout the many years that I've been doing this. So, um, so we That's very much appreciated. Thank yeah. But, but I know that when, um, you know, I think that there, I could tell like there were like the first day Randy came to look at the fabrics, we were going to a fitting and I was like, I'm sorry, I can't. And he was just so patient and he waited because it was super important and he needed to find out like you read armor in a script. Is this, and what do you think? It, it could have been, tin you know but we decided very early on that it was not going to be um metal um and then it was a fi matter of figuring out what it was going to be and and i proposed like so you start developing ideas and showing ideas to joel and then um and so that's where maybe we can bring up this uh piece of research so in figuring out macbeth for instance I showed Joel this piece of reference, among others, that was uh, that I found in like a museum's website, and it was a doublet. But you know, we should also say that we I we did a black and white film called The Man Who Wasn't There, and so you learn a few things from doing you know in your career and your body of work, and you find out that like texture and depth is hugely important, not only in all film. I think like texture and um, literally a indentation you know like where the seam is and having some bit of rise and then an indentation again like those things can be very interesting on film particularly in black and white and when i came upon, upon this research i was like well that would be very interesting in a black and white and so whenever i'm show we're showing this in color but then actually i had a side-by-side -side photo with joel in black and white i just printed started printing everything in black and white and he responded very positively to this. He was like, yes, I like that idea. And so then the next step after showing him that research, the next meeting we had, I showed him something very similar to this next, if you could bring up that. Now, you know, that sketch stinks, but it kind of gets the point across of what the shape was to like sort of bring Macbeth, give him a shoulder, bring him in at the waist, and then sort of have it triangulate out. And that, so that's how that kind of concept happened. So what ended up happening was we started, we started, once I 
once I, I think I had 10 weeks to prep. I don't remember, but like the first week out was f f finding the fabrics and culling them and getting them to, to into the, our shop and, and workshopping for lack of a better word, just doing lots and lots of samples. Um, we had our tailor and how big is the diamond and what kind of thread and what color is it? And what are we going to make it out of? And, um, and every step of the way, because of the importance of the lighting and Bruno, we had the good fortune of Bruno was there almost the entire time of prep, which you don't always have with a cinematographer. But Joel and myself, every, I mean, I felt very strongly, and so did Joel. Like, he always deferred, like, but every choice of color and fabric, I would defer, you know, I would first show it to them and to show it to both Joel and Bruno. And if Bruno wasn't in the room, Joel would say, we should get, Bruno to sign off on this and it was just because the tone of it right because Bruno and Joel knew exactly you know and sometimes it needed to be the right tone because sometimes it's a, in a direct light and sometimes that same actor in the same costume is in a shadow and I found that it was medium tones that were our friend for costumes um, and we used dark and I, I proposed I said you know and I'm kind of assuming that everybody who's watching this is familiar with the Macbeth um, scream or play and if you're not it's an interesting play and and in order to understand it though i'm not gonna lie i had to use no fear shakespeare to understand what was going on and that really helped me get it but that was sorry to make that aside but um i lost my train of thought anyway um so every every approach though, about medium, medium tones and oh yes medium tones and so we just started making silhouettes and then for Fran we started make we started building her clothes in muslin and so that's sort of it's just a cheap way to make it but what we ended up building Macbeth's outfit out Macbeth's costume out of was linen and linen is inexpensive enough so we just cut right into the real cloth and and then we just proceeded from there and it was we camera tested um that was that's a nightmare story that I'm not going to go into right now. But um, we the camera test initially was it is very it's a very helpful process, especially for a black and white film. And some of it we some of the fabric we just had a big roll of it before we actually cut into it before we spent the money to make the costume and spent the money to buy the fabric. And you can there are places in Los Angeles that will let you memo out a bolt. Of fabric so you don't have to buy it you can memo it out and show it to those people that you might need approval for before you actually spend the money and buy the yardage and we had to do that um, we we were it was a very thrifty film so that kind of ability was very 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 helpful and the other thing we had the good fortune is that we were able to use some of the fabrics that um, Warner Brothers have in a fabric room of theirs and we just did a um, a trade like we built some garments for some background people and we use their fabric so we didn't have to buy the fabric and then we they're going to get the garment at the end um, but we had a tailor shop and and the tailor the head tailor has his seamstresses that help build the clothes and we built all the clothes for Macbeth and for Lady Macbeth in-house and some of the other peripheral characters and then we use shops all over town to sort of um, pick up the slack that our, our shop couldn't do. And, but the majority of the film was built, which means that you make it from scratch. We were able to rent boots. I just decided that we would use a particular boot that's sort of a nondescript um, clean line. And we rented most of those. We, had, we built the pair for Denzel. But some pants were rented, but otherwise everything in the film was made, which means with the exception of Lady Macbeth and Lady Macduff, that everything also has to be aged. And so it's a very labor intensive process when you build everything. But I love, that's my, pr I love building. Um, it's, you have more control. And I think I'm a bit of a control freak. So you have control of over every element. It's not like you're shopping it and having to modify it, but, um, but it, it's, it was uh, really gratifying to be able to like go from sketch to then kind of see what it ended up turning out like and some happy accidents happened. And, um, but it was a, it was a 
really, really good experience. And I learned a lot. And um, I don't know. I think that's about it. That's all I have to say. Is there anything that I'm missing? I think that's anyway, that's and then so you go you start your fittings and you Joel did come into a fitting with Denzel and he would sometimes come into fittings with Fran and otherwise you take the photograph of your fitting and then you I like to show them in person, but not you can't always do that. And then you sort of that's how the approval process goes. And again, every time Joel saw something he liked, we would then try to find Bruno somewhere and Bruno was came, was pretty happy with the clothes in the film and and that's always good and I love working with Bruno he's such a lovely man and uh is very easy to speak to and approachable and um he makes himself he you understand what he's what he needs very easily and he's a really good communicator that way the interesting thing too about your you know your job I think and that is um not always fully appreciated is that the you know on the one hand i mean you're designing clothes to you know uh, according to the you know sort of aesthetic that the director is is trying to you know impose on the film but at the same time they're like they have to be worn by actors you know they're it's the the clothes have to have to be they have to support the performance that the actor is delivering. And that means different things for different people. You know, sometimes it's, sometimes it's something like the actor doesn't, they, they want it to be comfortable. They don't want to think about it. They don't want to mess around other people. It's like, it's a, it's like putting on a mask. It's a thing, you know, you get, you're getting into the character and it's, so there's like, Often, in addition to all the dialogue with the director and the cinematographer, there's a whole nother sort of sidebar thing that is happening with the cast members to sort of allow them to inhabit whatever character they are that, and, and have the clothes be part of that transformation, right. you know. Right, and, and be ha part of that world. Like I said, there were, um, there were fair, a fair amount of supporting cast that are up there, you know, number two or number three, four, not four, but five all the way through 10 who are soldiers and just a great cast of people and their transformation getting into the costume, like this silhouette that we came up from Macbeth plus the armor that, uh, I don't know if there's a picture of the armor, but anyway, um, you know, it, it, you could tell, you could see their transformation in the fitting room. Um, and even for characters that weren't in that costume, um, putting on the garment, you know, you're, you're, not, you're, you're, as a costume designer, it's your job to, I, to me, I always think of my boss as the director and you're servicing the script. You're helping to tell the story of the script and you're helping to serve the, the, the vision of the director. You have to be adherent to the budget that has been given to you or you have worked out with your producer. And then the most important part of the puzzle is how it works with the actor and how you can help transform that actor into the character that they're playing. And some actors, it helps them get there. And some actors are just very nonchalant about it. Like it doesn't really mean anything to them, but you have to make sure that unless you're trying to make someone look off kilter that it's a it not only it's something that they can go to camera with and feel like their character and they feel good about themselves in it and sometimes it's not always the flat, flattering but that it helps them get to, to that place and that transformation that happens in the fitting room and you know and like it happened time and time again with the cast like they would put their armor on and stand up a little straighter and you know i remember um cory just like he was like I need a moment. Like he kind of got teary eyed, you know, cause he was just like, he couldn't believe that he was in this movie and that he was going to be wearing this costume. And, um, it was awesome that you could have somebody feel that way, you know, and, and get to a place where they need to be. And like, I remember him and uh, like you mentioned before, Brad, Brad Einhorn, who's like my favorite prop master in the universe was the prop master on Macbeth. And he and I are in constant contact. Like, this is what the belt is going to look like. So then we're going to make the belt that holds the sword look like this. And this is how we're going to use the hooks. And so we made the belt and he made the shaft that holded the sword. But in every soldier fitting, he was there and, you know, they would whip out their swords and start, you know, 
doing the sword fighting and it just was really kind of fun to watch and magical and that that's what makes your i you know i do love my job a whole lot and that's one of the greatest thrills is to sort of see an actor get into character right in your fitting room and then the other one is to like see how the evolution of this concept where like i think back on that meeting that we had with joel where there are a bunch of photographs on a table and then you're in a film set and i remember like burnham wood was gorgeous and just all those trees and all the soldiers and there's a horse is on stage and you just get goosebumps you're like holy cow that it's like the perfect example of the of going from page to screen and and you know that's what it's all about and like you said before it is a combination of all the people who work on a film that make it happen and i couldn't do my job without my costume pa or without my tailor or i couldn't do my job without the shoemaker who built my boots for macbeth and it just you're just constantly grateful to like i find myself being like thank you thank you but it's true it comes from my heart and um you know you, you couldn't do it and we may I, I feel like i'm very excited to see this movie and i think that we made something really quite beautiful um i think we so all anyway those moments where we were standing there and had goosebumps. I mean, on, when we shot The Crossroads, our very first set, I mean, it was just staggeringly gorgeous. And I kept thinking, I can't believe we're getting to do this. I mean, yeah. I can't believe we get to work on this movie, you know, where it really kind of felt like this rare opportunity to, you know, make art for art's sake. And um, yeah, it was really special that when you constantly have those moments where you walk onto set and just go, God, I'm pinching myself. This is insanely gorgeous. And I kept saying when I was in film school, this is what I imagined my life would be like. Not all of it is really like that. But these right. this moment, you're like, oh my God, this is well, what I dreamed of. And let's be honest, in this, like, I've been doing, we've all been, well, some of us have been doing this long enough that we have seen the films that are getting green lit that we get jobs on change over the years. And uh, it's, there's a lot of, there's, there's not a lot of projects like this that come along. In no. fact, it's probably once in a lifetime. And, um, and, and they're fewer and farther between. And so that just makes the experience all the more, um, precious and well precious is the wrong word but just awesome i guess i don't know i'm sure that bob has a bet bob is much more articulate no than i think that's a i think that's a i i don't know i can't think of any word any better way to put it it's they're very um you know i'm i think all of us who have the good fortune to work on these kinds of projects you know we're very grateful because it's not it's not always the norm um we're going to probably open it up for some questions um, to people. I know there was one in the chat. There was one question I saw that someone had asked about um, the choice to shoot on black and white. And I, I'll clarify, we didn't actually shoot in black and white. We're, we, sh we First of all, we shot digitally. We shot with an Alexa camera um, in, as opposed to shooting film. It's very difficult now to shoot... To shoot 35, I mean, people have done it. I think the Lighthouse shot film when they, or no, actually they didn't. Um, there was something, uh, uh, there was another project recently, I think that shot on uh, black and white film, but it's, it's increasingly rare. And one reason is because frankly, the, the black and white film stock is just not what it used to be. It's, it's very slow. And if you try and push it, um, or use a faster stock, then you get a lot of grain uh, that is frequently not kind of what you're looking for. So we elected to shoot digitally, um, and we did. We shot with the, with the uh, with the Alexa, but we shot, and you can get the Alexa with the black and white sensor. But we elected to shoot it with the color sensor. The color sensor is apparently better; it's more sensitive, and you and it also provides you with a little extra flexibility in post production because. You know, if you get into a digital timing suite, you can select a specific color, and you you could use that ability to kind of manipulate the the contrast or the relative tones between different colors. Because sometimes, you know, 
you know, green or blue or red or whatever, depending on the intensity of the green or blue or red, might show up as a similar shade of gray. But if you can select one and and manipulate its intensity, you could change the if you need to sort of cause some separation where you weren't where you didn't actually get it. Um, so yes, we actually shot it's we shot in color, but the movie will be black and white. Uh, released in black and white, it'll be black and white in post. So. Yeah, we never saw it in color on set. It, it no, was, that's true. Was, You're it right. Went through a, it went through a lookup table before it even showed up on the monitors on set, yeah. which, was, which was really interesting. The other thing that was interesting to me, and it became clear um, when I, in some of these pre-pro meetings, I remember on, on The Man Who Wasn't There, in order to create, like, lots of... Um, you don't want to use all the same shade when you're doing a black and white film. It's better to use lots of, you know, you might use a, a red and a pink and a yellow and a gray. And, and that creates more, like, especially for background, you, it, it'll help give you depth of field by having actually those people in all of those areas sort of make sense and pop out. And when I started showing, I was like, maybe we make the servants the same silhouette. So every kind of clump and character in the movie and, and, and category were dressed the same. And so this was the shape for the servants. This is a shape for the female servants, male servants. These are the shape for the children. This is a shape for the women, et cetera. And we were talking about, should we make them different shades? And I remember showing Bruno and Joel like color, like real color. Like, so you get, and they both scrunch their nose. <laughs> Like, so you, like, even though we were filming in black and white and in, in black and white fashion in the move in black and white, when they shot films in black and white that were black projected in black and white in the early days of Hollywood, there were many, many colors. We always assume it's muted and earth tones, but they were using all kinds of colors. If you read the background or you read it, it's, they weren't using grays and taupes and browns, but we ended up. Like we had to filter the whole film, even though it's projected and being going to be shown in black and white, it had to be appealing and not cacophony to our naked eye. And so I threw that idea out really early on because I was like, okay, they have to act. And, uh, you know, and it makes sense because the actors have to act in this language that they're using and like it would it could have been very much a no, I know it's exactly it's like suddenly it's you could you could easily walk onto a set and sort of feel like you're in some sort of strange wizard of oz movie and, and the color right. section it would it might not have helped you get to where you needed right. to be exactly. performance wise and just and they did not want to look at it all day long which you know again like i said it was an evolution of concepts and uh anyway uh, let's see, I see a question here for Mary. How big is the design team you usually work with? Uh, I have, um, on this film, I, you always have to have a costume supervisor or a key, and your supervisor is who helps, um, I think I did an initial budget, and then they kind of take it over and make sure that there's input going on and, um, and making sure that we're always on track on a weekly basis, because the one thing you cannot do is go over budget, especially on a movie like this, but you can, you shouldn't to be a responsible costume designer, you should never go over budget and you have to make sure that you're not doing that. And so you have a supervisor and the supervisor, depending on who it is, some are like to work more visually than others. And some um, like to do all the paperwork themselves, but they're in charge of the paperwork and also in charge of like, you know, when the crew's call times are in. So you have a supervisor um, and then they sometimes have somebody who does their paperwork. And in this case, you know, it was, um, but Michelle did a lot of it, but, but then you have a, I had an assistant costume designer. Uh, we had a key, we had a costume PA. So that's four people. And then we had a tailor. Michael Sloan was our tailor and he had three, he had a table person and two stitchers because of all the manufacturing we were going to do. Sometimes you just have a tailor plus one or tailor plus two, but on this one, and again, you, you know this because you know you're going to have to build everything. And then I had, Macbeth had his own set customer because that was in his contract, Craig Anthony. And, um, and then we had two other set customers. And then we had additionals when we had background. Um, so I lost count, but around that many. <laughs> so.
I see there's a couple of hands. Uh, there's Jake, a question from Jake. Uh, hi, uh, how are you guys doing? Good. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, my question is kind of uh, centering around the fight scenes, um, especially how the ways you guys uh, put things together. Uh, did you go from storyboard or did you guys go from uh, pre-visualization uh, shots and then you followed the previs while you were on set? You know, it's it's interesting. Um, in a way, neither, um, it, which was a little bit different than than some than uh, sometimes Joel has worked in the past. I mean, certainly, you know, uh, Joel has always been a big storyboarder, and you know, back to Blood Simple, you know, they storyboard the entire movie, which is, um, I think, for for him is it. It's it's not that that we that the, the boards are always followed to the letter, but the process of creating them and creating them with the DP and and thinking through them is sort of part of the process of internalizing and kind of understanding the movie and how the what the best way to visually tell the story is. So it, it's it's just sort of part of the you know directorial storyboard or you know or, uh, storytelling process for him. Um, in this case, for the fight scenes, I mean, I think we, he had specific ideas about how it was going to work, and he had, specific, we had, he had specific ideas about the type of environment that they might take place in, but we kind of started from, um, from a, a, a rehearsal point of view in a way which was maybe a little bit different than, than on past projects. So we had the stunt team with a fight coordinator come in and they kind of worked up some ideas that then in, in a mocked up environment, you know, we took some, uh, you know, cardboard boxes and stacked them up to mimic how the sort of ramparts of the castle would, uh, would feel and, you know, how high they were and how wide the, how wide the set was. We had some kind of cardboard columns that we used to mock up the, you know, the throne room. There are two fights in this, in the play there's the first one is um, in the throne room where uh, Macbeth, I'm not, these are not spoilers because the play is, you know, hundreds of years old. <laughs> Macbeth, uh, Macbeth kills uh, Syward in, in a battle in the throne room. And then towards the end of the film, Macbeth is dispatched by Macduff uh, up on the, on the ramparts of the castle. And so really the, the fights and the specific choreography was developed um, through the rehearsal process with our stunt coordinator. Okay. Thank you for asking. Uh, Latoya in costume design. Hi. Um, my question was from Mary. Um, I know that at this point in your career, you um, are probably sought after for your skills, but um, have you ever had like looked at a script that probably was wasn't greenlit or was greenlit that you just kind of felt passionate about that you wanted to like be a part of it um you'd be, be surprised how unsought after i am um there are a lot of <laughs> costume designers in the world and 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 rightly so you know it's a very competitive field and i had this conversation with brad not too long ago, the prop master, I was like, how come there's a lot of people who want to get into costume design and nobody wants to get into props? Like, what is that? Like, it's such a weird thing. But anyway, um, but I have had that experience and where I wanted really badly to do a job. And I, I would say a couple of times I have not gotten the job and just like was devastated. And um, I can think of, a couple times where I have gotten the job. And one instance, which is like, like uh, the best story is, cause it's probably one of the most famous films that I worked on was La La Land. You know, I had seen Whiplash and I loved it. And um, I heard like Damien Chazelle is gonna make a musical. And I think that if, if I were living in a different time, I would be designing musicals all the time. I love working on them. Like the parts of Oh Brother where there was music were my favorite moments of filmmaking. And um, 
anytime, even inside Loom Davis, like the club scenes, like it's always, I just love it. It brings me joy to have music in combination. And so a musical in LA that Damien, and I was like, I'm on it. And I might have threatened my agent about it too. Like I might have said, if I find out that, you know, I need the meeting at least, like I need to be the first one in at the meeting and then whatever happens happens but i need to be in the meeting immediate like the minute it opens up or if it opens up or if they get greenlit and um and that was a very lucky i had a great meeting and and um i got the job but there you know i could tell you another story where i didn't get the job and like you know was like you know i cried i you know flat out cried you know i was like felt like a big loser and, um, but it happens, it happens all the time where you don't get them and you have to be prepared for that. You don't, you know, it's not as much as an actor has to deal with the rejection, but, um, but yeah, you, you know, both. Is that How do you prep for the meeting? Like, what do you bring? Like, do you bring, do you like go over the script and be like, okay, these are my ideas or like, what? what are some things that you like brought to the meeting to kind of express your wants to do it? Well, when I was an assistant designer, I was had the good fortune of assisting Richard Hornung, who was like, who was Joel and Ethan's costume designer starting with uh, um, right after blood symbol. So he did raising Arizona was his first one. And I was a, uh, I was friends with him. My first job with him was Barton Fink as a PA. And then I started assisting with him soon thereafter and he was my mentor and he stopped me from going to graduate school he said work with me i'll be your grad school that you don't have to pay for and what he told me he said do not bring visuals to a meeting but there are some exceptions to those rules but the reason why he told me not to bring visuals to a meeting was that those people not all directors, but the directors and the producers who might be in the room will always associate you with that's that design. Like, let's say, oh, she's an all black. Oh, she's a designer who thought she should be an all black. You know, for instance, I'm just I'm throwing out an idea. And, and you can't back up from that once it's a visual piece that you've brought in. Um, but I think he was referring to sketches and very visceral, virtual, like, this is or or explicit sketches of what you think that person should look like since then you know there are exceptions to those rules and then since then i think that there are some people ask you to bring in an idea and but i think the the part the the re, the thing you want to bring if you do bring material is something that is an idea and it's a it's an essence of what you are thinking as opposed to like once I think you do a sketch, to me it feels much more of a of an em emphatic idea. Like you've put down, you've taken the time to put it on paper because you. Every costume designer can think of another idea, you know. Like, but they'll always associate you with this visual that you've prepared. So you want it to be a little um, free flowing that you could ease. If you bring something, I think it should be something that you can like easily like switch gears if you can tell from their face that they're like you know sometimes you'll be you'll get the no like they're just like shaking their head or you'll get the look puzzled if you sense anything from that meeting that you're having from them that you have gone in the wrong direction you have to just switch gears and put away that book or whatever it is that you brought and just start talking about something else like think of another idea and it's always good to go to the meeting with more than one concept you know and and also you're talking to that director for the first time and so unless they've given you a certain amount of certain like materials like oh this is what they're looking for then you have to be very careful what you bring and also be nimble enough to change gears if you see it that you've gone down the wrong path in um in that proposition that you're making does that make sense yes it does okay. thank you okay you're welcome <laughs> um yeah and that's certainly is true for production designers as well that it's like a, it's just you know the directors typically have been thinking about whatever this project is for a long time and you're going in for the first time and so you have to kind of have the you know be able to pivot um 
Okay, a couple more questions. Uh, there is uh, Gotham. Thank you. Thank you for the beautiful presentation, guys. Uh, my question is for Peter. Uh, I was wondering if you know, just to bring the Sonic world into this into this old black and white world, did you consider uh, recording or mixing sound in in analog mixers? And you know, if not, uh, is there some other way that you felt like would would bring the Sonic world into this this world? That's an interesting question. I would say that there are many people in this industry who would say that I did use equipment that was would have been used in the 1100s, which is when this movie was based. <laughs> uh, on, on some movies, you know, uh, on Inside Moon Davis, on um, Walk the Line, uh, we, we used a lot of the equipment of the era, the microphones and whatnot, because it made the, the, the music and the singing and everything sound particularly authentic. Um, and uh, so, so that, I, I would do that a lot, but there's, but there's, Filmmaking now has gotten so complicated that, you know, it's important for things to be small. It's incredibly difficult to find uh, analog quarter-inch tape. And to, I mean, I, I have all that equipment. I just, it's, it's difficult to use. So, so the, when, we're, when we're dealing with period stuff, uh, it's usually two things. It's one is to try to match the sonic quality like you're talking about by using uh, period microphones, um, which have to be in good working order, so they have to sound like a, the microphone would have sounded like when it was made in 1940. Um, but the other thing is exactly the opposite, which is you're dealing with a world in which nobody expects to hear an airplane. Nobody expects to hear a fan or any of these modern sounds. And so I have to use every bit of modern technology uh, at my disposal, or mostly at Skip's disposal, to to try to recreate the sound of that period because that sound no longer exists in the universe. Uh, that's the, that's the bigger challenge. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Michael Barnum, I think, and I saw you something in the chat too, but, um. Oh, hello. Thank you all for having such an intimate and a generous look uh, into this production. Uh, it seems as though the design philosophy of it, made all the departments uh, fall into place in alignment. Maybe yes, maybe no. Like things were just copacetic. Uh, and I'm sure there were challenges and conflicts of aesthetics, but do you think that the sort of interdepartmental dynamic, um, the, the ease with which it seems to have all worked and the level of collaboration and cooperation, do you think that's unique to this production compared to others you've worked on? Uh, and is that a result of the, the sort of expressionistic design philosophy that was imposed? So if I may, just real quick, uh, Joel had such a str strong sense of what this movie was that really he was the final arbiter, he, he and Bruno. And um, I, I, we had such a short prep that just for me, it was just really trying to get the sets made. I, I would have loved to have more interaction with Mary, it, not only just to, to, to make sure that the aesthetic was working with what where she was going, but just like, I, I might be her biggest fan. And just that, that alone would be great. But Joel really, he and Bruno really had this thing in their head. It was like a dream that they had. It, like when, when I worked on Avatar, uh, someone said Cameron had been to Pandora. We have to figure out what it is. This was like, Joel had a dream and we had to figure out what it was because some things are, murky and we're figuring it out but he had man he had such a strong point of view that i think we could all fall into it and you knew that that it was all going to be okay i mean we had also i mean i will say i think um yes I, and i agree with that i think that a lot of times you know that's um you know when you have a, a director who with a strong vision and who is willing and able to to communicate and disseminate that throughout the through the crew that's when you are most apt to get these you know departments all working in, in a synchronous way you know i mean for us obviously also we have the on a movie like this we have the benefit of as i said at the beginning of uh of this whole thing you know i've known a lot of these people for almost 30 years you know i mean i i've you know like joel Mary, 
Karen, you know, I mean, all the, you know, Stefan has been around on a couple of projects, even all of the, all of the department heads with very few exceptions were people that we had worked with that some, some I may have done, you know, 12, 14 movies with, you know, I mean, that's a long history and you develop a shorthand and that, you know, frequently leads to things working in tandem well. But I was also going to say, uh, not to bring up money problems, but there were really serious financial issues on this movie at, at multiple times. And it felt to me as a result of the huge money problems that we had to overcome, that the collaboration was more intense than I think it usually is. I mean, in a large part, it was just all of us getting into a room and constantly going, okay, we tried this, we tried this, what else can we try? Um, you know, and Stefan constantly coming back with new ideas about, you know, as Bob mentioned earlier, things that we could reuse and recycle. Um, but, you know, we pulled a lot, a lot of other you know, crew members that aren't normally in on these really intense discussions, you know, with the director and the DP were often there, like our, you know, rigging departments, you know, our gaffer, our key grip and their rigging keys, um, our construction coordinator, everybody in the same room, just trying to really figure out the nuts and bolts of it. So, um, yeah, I felt like there was a lot of collaboration just in because we had big problems to solve. That, yeah, I think that's right. Uh, I see one more from Katerina. Uh, Mary was trying to say something, but she's... Oh, sorry, Mary, yeah. You. you know, one thing for the people who are going to become producers, which as a crew member I find very helpful and what served this movie very well, was we managed to have us... We were filming on the Warner Brothers lot, and we managed to make it so all departments were on the lot. And, and so we weren't in the production office as a costume department, but we were very close by. And when Stefan was just saying, like, you know, we never, we had very few, like, face-to-face, -face, sit down, have a conversation, because we didn't have time. But Stefan, the way he made his department, like, you could walk into the art department, which was in the cost, or which is in the production office, which was, you know, a couple blocks from my office, and I could see what was happening on his walls. Okay, it's like shorthand. You get it? Okay, we don't have time to talk about it, but I can visualize it and leave. And like any time that having that being all under one roof was so helpful, and it's always helpful, but particularly when your your budget is um, challenged, it's a super helpful. I love it. It's my favorite thing when everybody it, can. Be it's a little bit, you know, and it's also it's a little bit about how old Hollywood worked. You know, that's how it that's how the whole studio system was designed. You know, everything was all in this compound and there was the art department was here and the, and the costume department was there and the, and you know, it's, it's like a, it's a factory. And so, you know, we were able to sort of recreate a little bit of that at uh, Warner brothers where we were shooting. So, uh, so Katarina. Hi everybody, thank you so much for uh, this amazing panel. It really made me feel like I want to work right now, I want to get on set, uh, <laughs> even though it would be complicated. But um, So uh, my question is for Stefan. So I'm an aspiring uh, professional uh, production designer. I've been working on uh, student th films, but uh, now in these past years I've been working on feature film as a production designer. Obviously I'm talking about low budgets and that was, um, I mean, I don't know if it was the budget per se or the director, but this experience as a production designer were not the best for me. Uh, because first of all, I found myself, as Bob says, like with the, being like six people. So the old art department most of the time was just me. And uh, also I felt like there was not much interest from like the produ produ production and the director. I mean, I felt like the art department was not very uh, understood as a main part of the film. So my question is, I really feel like I have enough experience now to kind of like move forward and upgrade myself working on maybe films where like our department is a little bit more, you know, um, kind of in, an important role because that's what it should be, right? And so I was wondering if you have this kind of experience, how you move uh, and upgrade yourself uh, to then get with this amazing production on Muppet and work with this, all these talented people. 
Uh, yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. You know, um, first of all, Macbeth was just another gift for me. You know, um, yeah, it was just a complete gift. And it, it, to me, I, I think it's a once in a lifetime thing for me. Um, but it, here, I'll tell you something that's interesting. You know, when I started designing, when I moved from art direction to designing, I, I was actually, on, I was on a show helping it get up and going. It would eventually become uh, the Jurassic, whatever that next Jurassic World movie was. And I was starting to meet with different people. And um, I was meeting on, I forget what, I, and I was, it wasn't like I was getting hired. I was, I was just, I had a brilliant track record of being everyone's second choice. And um, mostly because I had not, designed anything and um I, I was going to meet with this on this show that was kind of sketchy and um and the producer uh, of of jurassic he pulled me in his office he said you know you might want to think about who you're meeting with and and make sure that you're meeting with the people that you really really want to work with and and now i had a different experience than, than you're having because I, I was fortunate enough to fall in with a group of people that I that were just generous, kind, inspirational. You, you know, the, the people I worked as an art director and a storyboard artist with, they were amazing. And so uh, it was kind of, it, it's easier for me to say that, you know, but I think it's, it's important that you kind of, when you're having these meetings, it's not just about you. And, and that they, they want to have you come on, you should be gauging them as well and, and feel like, is this a group of people I really want to work with? And um, I think that's that's the challenge of it, uh, you know, is because it could be a larger, it, it can be a larger budget movie and, and they don't care about the art direction either. Not that it's necessarily bad, it's just like, oh, okay, that's the director's point of view, but, um, I, I wish I had a better answer for you. You know, that it's, it's trying to find the, the, the people who want to, to, that, that can help you. And, and listen, part of this is kind of this, this program here. I mean, if, if you wanted to, I'll send you my email and you can reach out to me and, and, and we can talk further. But that would because, be great. <laughs> well, I'll tell you just very, very quickly. I got in this business because people always were generous to me. Yeah. I was working. Uh, I was working at a graphic design department on Wall Street yeah. when a, when a woman asked me, "What do you want to do?" and I said, "I just want to graduate. I'm not a great graphic designer. I want to study film, and I'm interested in visual effects at that time." And she said, "Oh, you mean like Lucasfilm, Industrial Light, Magic?" And I said, "Yeah." And she said, "I know a guy that works here. I'm going to give you his number." And the next thing I know, I'm working with him. I, I have a my wife's working on True Grit. And for some reason, they make a replacement in the art director, and Nancy Haig recommends me. So I think the, my point being is that um, you try to find that, that, as much as you're trying to find the projects, find the people that you want to work with. And, and because uh, of all the generosity that I've had to, in, for me, uh, uh, Bob included, uh, um, you know, after this, I'll just send you my email and we can talk further and just see like what, 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 what's out there or even just a sounding board because I had it. I had it in my twenties. I had those people who could help me. And, and that was just very, um, I don't know. It was, it was important to me. And I, I really believe strongly in that kind of paying it forward. Yeah, that would be really appreciated. Also, because unfortunately, I, I studied from, in New York Film Academy is a very international uh, school and all the people I work with, um, they all are gone. They're all back to their country. So also I found like my network now is like getting smaller and smaller. So I'm trying to reach to people, you know, through MDB Pro and, but still like, you know, it's not, it's, uh, it's especially with the COVID time. So, um, yeah, but I appreciate, thank you so much for all your, um, advice. Yeah. Um, I absolutely understand. I agree with everything and yeah. <laughs> thank you. I think we have time for one more uh, question from Veronica, I think. Hello, guys. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for all this. This is really enlightening for me, and I think for most of us, uh, the Academy Goal 2020. 
I wanted, like Katharina, to be a production designer as well. Uh, but in this program, I have, you know, discovered different things that I'm kind of like leaning into or, you know, interested and stuff. So uh, most of it has been, it has to do with creative development artists. So I guess that's more into like not in production itself. Before that, like how to get to production, like <laughs> all the before. But at the same time, uh, I'm trying to, I want to do through that route because at some point I want to be a director. And I have done my research of how going to the DGA training, uh, doing assistant directing and all that. Uh, but I don't know. I wanted to, you know, hear from you guys if maybe, you know, I, what I have heard from people with more experience is that most of them want to be directors as well, but they have decided to go through a branch and then go from that branch to another one. So I just wanted to know a little bit of your experience um, about this matter. Uh, in a way, for me, it has been most likely of everything related to our department and then maybe eventually uh, being a director. Uh, but I have seen in the last couple of months uh, with the people I have been talking with that that's kind of like not a possibility, like it shouldn't be that way. So I just would like to know your input about this matter. Well, I, I just, I, I'll chime in. I'm not, I'm not in the art department, but I'll say I, I worked with Bo Welch so many times and he, he was a fantastic designer, still is, but then he got into directing and he brought a lot of that same aesthetic with him. Um, and it, it, that's mm -hmm. certainly a path you can take. Um, I, but as I, what I say to a lot of uh, people who are getting into the industry, you know, every film has, you know, one, one director, but there's another 150 people working on the movie and they've all got yeah. good jobs. And some of those people, they, they got into the business to do one particular thing. You know, uh, I was talking about Randy Johnson, the boom operator I work with. He started as a boom operator probably 50 years ago and he's retiring as a boom operator and he's been very, very happy with that career. I don't think it ever crossed his mind uh, to direct. Uh, I don't know how he would be at it. He'd probably be great at it. He certainly knows everything there is to know about film after being on set his whole life. Um, but, you know, either thing can happen. I've seen, you know, my, uh, a, a friend of mine was a grip. He became a director and then he went, he directed for a while in the music video world and then he became a boom operator. And so, you know, any, anything can happen. And, and I don't, it, it just, it, it's about what you want to do. It's also, it's a, it's a yeah, and, and there is no established path to becoming a director. Be, being an assistant director, is not a way to become a director. They're not the, They're not even the, They're not even related jobs in a strange way. And so it's the best. The best way to become a director is to start directing things. You know, directing things, directing short films, directing student films, directing films you shoot on your iPhone. You know, you got a friend who's a singer, direct their music video. Whatever. It's like all of those things. You know, it the or write things, you know, write your own scripts, then direct them. You know, it's, it's, but there's no, there's no ladder for that in the, in the way that uh, maybe there, I don't even know if there ever was back in the day, but, um, but yeah, as Peter said, there's a lot of different ways to. Yeah. Know. But my, my question is it's more about like, for example, I got, all of you guys have a union, you know, like there's a union for art department, there's a union for sound, yeah. there's a union for directors as well, that is yeah. in DGA. And then all these people are telling me that, no, like that, that training, it's only for assistant directors. That's and right. From there, so, so I'm kind of confused. That's my no, thing. I'll, you know, I'll, like, tell you, I'll, I'll tell you this about the DGA. This is the thing about the DGA. It's like the DGA is, is a, um, you know, is it fantastic? I'm a member of the DGA. It's a fantastic union. Um, it's, it, they have a very sort of codified set of rules that, you know, for you to get into the DGA and acquire enough experience and become an assistant director and work your way up from being a trainee to a second assistant director to a first assistant director to a UPM, et cetera, et cetera. Directors, separate thing. If you, like, if you, if you are directing a movie and you want to become, and, that, and you want that movie to become signatory to the Directors Guild, Boom, you're in. You're a director now. You're in the DGA. Like, it's not difficult to get into the DGA as a director. 
if but you have to but you have to sort of get you have to have you have, you have to be directing the movie first it's not a it's you know it's yeah. uh no, it's not, I, what, I, what I'm trying to say is that the, is that the the you don't need to be a DGA member to get a directing job, but once you get the directing job, they will let you in. It's there's not it's not a barrier to uh, to entry in the same way that it is, frankly, for assistant directors and mm -hmm. UPMs and whatnot. You have to hire so, a director. That's the criteria for the DGA to allow you in as a director. Somebody has to hire you as a director. Exactly. So if somebody gives you a chance to, if you like, whatever, your friend has a TV show that's going to be, you know, whatever, like you're directing a, a Quibi series, you can get into the DGA. That's not the problem. Um, the problem is just getting hired in the first place. So. Well, they were saying that it has to, like, that show or whatever you're directing has to be, like, more than one one hundred thousand dollars or something like that it has a budget like it can't be just like me directing two short films no that's life, probably true that's i mean i'm sure that there are i'm sure that it's it's they they there, there might be uh, thresholds where they consider it has to be a sort of certain size professional production it, right it can't just be you making a, your film at home mm -hmm. you so that leads me to then i will have to meet someone that gives me this opportunity but to meet that someone i will have to work under that person as what as well, you, may for have to make, you may have to make that opportunity for yourself you may have mm -hmm. a project that you care deeply about either you've written it or you work with a writer and you say this is the most important project i want to do and you make that project happen you know, I know when we did Blood Simple, th that was a thing. I, I, I overheard uh, Ethan describing to somebody how that movie got made, and he said, well, basically, we wanted to do it, we wrote it, we worked on it, and we sold everything, and we gave up everything, so we had no choice but to make it. And that, that's, that's how that happened. And, and that was, it, you know, it was not a huge budget, but it was certainly within the budget that they could have joined the DGA then had they wanted and, to. And Joel, Joel and Ethan didn't even join the DGA till Big Lebowski. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like the two things are a little separate. It's not, it's, you don't have to worry about getting into the DGA in order to get a directing job. You, you, is, is exactly what Peter said. You're going to have to sort of make your own opportunity you know, and that's what film school is for, in a way. That's the best It's the best thing about film school. It isn't even always the things that you learn in film school. It's all the connections that you make with your students, which, of course, in this, you know, time period is a little difficult. But you're, you know, the, the fact that you are able to collaborate on other people's projects and you're shooting something and whatever, and you make a connection, you make a, you have a friend, and then you develop something together, and then you end up, you know, directing it as a short and you use that to shop around and find somebody who's going to give you a chance to make it as a feature. And, you know, there's no set way to do it, but that's, that's kind of the idea. The method of creating the short and then putting the short in a festival, or I know that's how, um, uh, you know, you make, they made a short of whiplash got it to Sundance and then they got the money through that to make, to flesh it out into the movie. But I think that what somebody said beforehand is crucial, like to have a passion for a specific, some, some, a story you want to tell, you have to, um, you know, you, it has to burn inside you like, cause, cause it's going to be hard and mm -hmm. it has to be something that gives you the momentum and the motivation to like work. It's just, you know, it's, it's not easy, but then anyway, blah, blah. I don't know what I'm talking about. No, 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 I, I love this. I love Yeah. I mean, you know, you AFI, so is always, I, AFI is a great directing program. I mean, that's, a, you know, I don't know. It's like the, 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 that's what is particularly the graduate film schools. That's kind of what they're great for is making those yeah, connections. I, experience behind a camera. I have already a movie. I have already a movie that I wanted to submit to festivals. But my thing is that with all this coronavirus happening, I don't know if it like I wanted to go to festivals and it's, it has to be by Zoom. You know what I mean? Like I'd rather yeah, have the experience right. in person like I used to do it before. And now that I have a beautiful film that I feel really proud of, that I want to show and I want to have, you know, uh, do something with this, as you guys say, I don't want to like toss it, you know, just you know, yeah. flush it, just wait, I'm, no, then wait, wait, exactly. yeah, wait, and make another one. So yeah. I have another show. one. <laughs> make another That's one. Great. So you have two to show and then That's they'll be great. like, holy moly, she's got two. And when you okay. got the, and when you, and when you, when you get a chance to show the first movie at a festival, have another project 
in mind that you have it. To make. I have it. <laughs> because they want again, people are gonna look at your film and they're gonna say, What do you want to do next? And then you wanna say, This is what I want to do next. And so that's yeah, I have a whole list <laughs> There you everything. go. See, you're all set to go. <laughs> the distribution formats are changing so fast now, and particularly in you know the coronavirus era, that you know, Quibi, I, I don't know how successful that's gonna be. But, you know, I, I don't think five years ago any of us would have been thinking we'd make a living out of making five-minute movies, uh, even if they're really feature films to buy into five minutes. And if, if you create a film that works on an online format or on a Zoom format or on Quibi or something like that, you know, have that film, do that film now when people are desperate for product that plays in those formats. And then if you have a film that is going to play best in theaters – then do that when the theater is available. Okay. He brings up a very good point because now is different than all of us who are on this panel who are of a certain age. It's changing. The times are changing. And that's a great point, Peter. Like you could become, you know, who knows what, whether you're going to have theatrical releases 20 years from now, but you know, capitalizing on these platforms that are available now is a, is, is, is an opportunity that wasn't there five years ago or, and, and you're right, Peter, that's a great idea. Yeah. And now those, those, those new platforms can be monetized in a way they never could be before. So you can actually do it and have a, have a budget and, you know, and actually, you know, make a professional career out of it. Whereas that, that also was not possible a few years ago. Okay. Okay. I think that's the end of our time. Yeah, it is. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Bob, Karen, Mary, Stefan, and Peter for spending part of your Saturday with us. This was so insightful. And I know a lot of us are very excited to check out the tragedy of Macbeth and to see your work. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.